In this video, we're going to be taking a look at testing a proportion P. And this is lowercase p that we're talking about. So this represents the population proportion of successes. Okay, population proportion of successes. So when we're doing this kind of hypothesis testing, it's vitally important that you pay attention to the appropriate um, symbols that you want to use. Because in the same problem, we're going to be talking about lowercase p, which is the population proportion of successes. So pop, prop of successes. S-U-C-C-E-S-S-E-S. -S -E -S. There we go. Um, you'll also have lowercase p hat, which is the sample proportion of successes. And you will also have the p value, which is the capital P, and that's the thing that helps us conclude our test. So it's really vitally important that you're using the appropriate symbol to label the appropriate thing. Otherwise, you have three different things running around in the same problem called P. And if you can't keep them straight, that's going to cause a lot of, of computational issues for you. Okay. So um, just like what we were looking at with testing means, testing proportions, uh, very similar process in terms of the overall setup um, that we follow for hypothesis testing. Just like what we were looking at with means, we have a set of conditions that need to be met. So conditions for inference. When we're talking about testing a proportion P. Unsurprisingly, we need a simple random sample. Again, all of these hypothesis tests are based on the notion that your sample was collected randomly. If you have a sample that already has bias introduced, then these hypothesis testing methods do not yield valid conclusions. And then the uh, method for testing a proportion P, whether we're going to do it by hand or use the calculator program, presupposes that P hat follows a normal distribution. And we know from our section on sampling distributions that p hat will follow a normal distribution when np is greater than 5 and nq is greater than 5. And that's an and there. Both of these things have to be greater than 5 um, in order to proceed again with the, the inference. Uh, from there, again, it's basically the same set of steps that we've been doing. We start by identifying our null and alternate hypotheses. We check conditions, uh, make sure that the conditions for inference are met. If they are met, then in the calculator, we will use one prop Z test. Or if we're going to do it by hand, we, we can do it by hand, and I'll, sh I'll show you both methods. Um, so then we decide what to use. We use it. We obtain the p-value. Then we compare the p-value to the alpha level to determine, you know, what do we do with the null hypothesis? Do we reject? Do we fail to reject? And then we interpret the conclusion in the context of the problem. Okay, so those are all of our steps. So let's take a look at an example. And in this example... Uh, we have women athletes at the University of Colorado Boulder have a long-term graduation rate of 67%. So women athletes at UC Boulder, long-term grad rate of 67%. Then it says, over the past several years, a random sample of 38 women athletes at the school. So we have random sample, n equals 38 women athletes, uh, showed that 21 of those 38 eventually graduated. Does this indicate that the population proportion of women athletes who graduate from UC Boulder is now less than 67%? Okay, so does this indicate grad rate 
of women athletes, whoops, let's move that up. From UC Boulder is now less than 67%. And we want to use uh, a 5% level of significance. Okay, so there's what we're doing. Now, we will start in part A with our identifying our null and alternate hypotheses and our level of significance. Oops, so part A, we want to state H sub 0 h sub 1, and our level of significance. Since we are being asked to test a population proportion, um, because we're talking about rates here, we're not talking about averages, our null and alternate hypotheses should be about lowercase p, right? They should be about the population proportion. They should not be about mu, which would be about an average or about a mean, and that's not what we're being asked here. So we'll start with the assumption that nothing has changed in the past few years. And if nothing has changed in the past few years, UC Boulder should still have a long-term graduation rate for its female athletes of 67%. So we should be looking at P is equal to 0.67. And since we were being asked to test that it's now less than 0.67, that's exactly what we're going to test in our alternate hypothesis. P is less than 0.67. And we were asked to use a 5% level of significance, so we're looking at alpha equals 0.05 or 5%. Okay, so there's what we've got. Notice that when I put that percentage into the null and alternate hypotheses, it's expressed in its decimal notation. That's important because that's the way that the calculator will expect it to be expressed. Or if you're going to do this by hand, the by hand formula also expects it to be as a decimal. Then in part B, we need to check our requirements or conditions for inference. We need to know that we have a simple random sample and we need NP and NQ to be greater than five. It did say that this was based on a random sample of 38 women athletes, so that part is met. NP and NQ we can check. Now note that this is different from when we did this in um, the section on confidence intervals. There we were looking at the values from the sample, right? We were using NP hat and NQ hat because we didn't have values for p and q. Here we actually have a hypothesized value for p, right, lowercase p. So we can actually compute these directly. Our n was 38, our hypothesized p value is 0.67, and when I multiply 0.67 by 38, I get 25.46, which is definitely greater than 5, so that's my np. I also then need to check NQ, and if Q is 0.67, then, or I'm sorry, if P is 0.67, then Q is 0.33, right? So we take 0.33 times 38, we get 12.54, that's also greater than 5. Okay, so that condition is met. We have a simple random sample. We have NP and NQ greater than 5, so we know that it's okay to go ahead and proceed with the rest of the hypothesis test. In part C, we then want to find or estimate the p-value, and this is capital P because this is the one that's going to help us conclude the test. Okay, find or estimate the p-value. So here, if you're going to do this by hand, um, what you would do is you would start by coming up with your, your p-hat. So this is a by hand method. First, we want to find p-hat. So this is the proportion of successes in the sample. 
there were 21 out of 38 who eventually graduated. And so our P hat is about 0.55, right? About 55%. Then we need to um, convert this value to a z-score using the formula z equals p hat minus p divided by square root pq over n. Okay, our p hat is 0.55. Our hypothesized value for p from up here was 0 0.67 divided by square root 0 0.67, 0 0.33 over n, which is 38. Okay, so 0 0.55 minus 0 0.67 divided by square root 0 0.67 times 0 0.33 over 38. And we get about negative 1.57. Now, since we were testing to see what's the probability of being less than that, we'd be looking for the probability that z is less than negative 1.57. We would put that into, whoops, into normal CDF, negative 100, negative 1.57, And when we crunch that through, we get about 0 0.0582. Okay, so there's our value. Now, if we're not going to do this by hand, that's our P value, sorry. Capital P value. Right here. If we're not going to do this by hand, um, in the calculator, the thing that we would use, again, is the one prop Z test. Okay, so we go to stat, over to the right to tests, down to one prop z test. Notice there's also a two prop z test. We'll look at that in a different video. But you want to select one prop z test. Then what it'll ask you for here, the p sub zero is the p value uh, from your null hypothesis. That's lowercase p. So in this case that was 0.67. X is the number of successes in your sample. We had 21. N is the sample size. We had 38. And then you select your alternate hypothesis. We were testing a less than. So we want to select the one in the middle that has the less than symbol. And then we calculate. And we've got a point oh six one nine. Why is that? because it should be roughly the same as what we got here, and it's not. Oh, we have a p hat of point, point five five. Oh, it's just, I'm sorry, it's because they kept more decimal places here, so we were off here. We had negative 1.57 when we were doing it by hand. Calculator has negative 1.54, roughly, um, and then we have a point oh six one nine. So the difference that we got here doing it by hand versus doing it on the calculator is simply because we did some rounding here, um, and so that rounding propagates through, okay? Um, but so doing it by the calculator, our p-value is approximately 0 0.0619. And this is actually a better value to use than the one that we got doing it by hand because it doesn't involve any rounding error, okay? It's actually a more accurate value. Now, when we're taking a look at that value, in part D, that's what we want to compare our p-value to our alpha level to determine what we do with the null hypothesis. Do we retain it, or do we, do we fail to reject it, or do we reject it? So in part D, our p-value was 0 .061, whoops, 0619, which is, whoops, greater than our alpha level of 0 0.05, right? 0.06 is about 6%. We were looking at a 5% level of significance. It's greater than. And since our mnemonic device is if the P is low, the HO must go, here our P value is not low. So we fail to reject the null hypothesis.
and we fail to reject it. Doesn't mean that it's conclusively been proven true, it just means we don't have enough evidence to show that it's not true. Okay. So then in part E, what have we shown? Well, our null hypothesis was that the long-term graduation rate at UC Boulder was 67%, and we failed to reject that. So it's kind of like we're hanging on to it for now until better evidence comes along. What does that mean in context? Well, it means that at the 5% level of significance, there wasn't enough evidence to indicate the claim that we were trying to test. So there is insufficient evidence to indicate that the long-term graduation rate of female athletes at UC Boulder is now less than 67%. Okay, we didn't have enough evidence to indicate that it was less than. You don't necessarily want to say that there's sufficient evidence to indicate that it's equal to 67% because that's not actually what we were trying to test. If you go back to the original wording of the problem, we were trying to test, does this essentially do the data indicate that the graduation rate is now less than 67%? And we didn't find that to be true. So there's insufficient evidence to support that claim. And that's the wording that you want to use there.